strictly enforced curfews. The full moon's pale. Pray for day. Rachel, something is up in the zone. Amen, Uncle Ty. Amen. We're going up the mountain to do some camping. <laughs> Only a fool would do that. Well, we got five of them in here. At least tell me where you're going, so that when you don't come back, I'll know how to fill out the report. Somebody broke into the campus. <laughs> Easy, man. What happened? What is trying to get you, man? Demons. The lawyer never said anything about people up here. I was in the water and I felt a hand and I saw you on the shore, so the hand wasn't you. Jonathan, there's someone in that lake and it wasn't you. Calm down, honey. The raccoon stole some of my makeup. Our friend was killed. Can't find the others. All right, I found my caramel cream. It's been a murder. My nephew, Rachel. Get off this land. You got no business here. Skadoot. Gonna raise the devil now. Oh, Daniel, take me. Take me right here in the graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> They're dead, boy. Megan and Daniel, they're not dead. It's lost. I told you not to come up here. Hello, this is Caitlin O'Haney, the final girl from He Knows You're Alone. And you're listening to The Hysteria Continues. And indeed you are. Welcome back to Hysteria Continues, um, episode 94. So we're getting up to the hundreds, Mark. Um, and we have a feeling this show may be a little bit... Oh, there we go. A little bit stuttery because Skype is um, not being very cooperative today. So It's being a cunt. Oh, Eric. I was trying to avoid the C word. At least it didn't stutter when you said that. Not yet, mm-hmm. but um, but yes, uh, Skype is not being our friend today, so we, we're going to persevere and see how we go, but it could be a little bit like a 80s remix uh, or a Duran Duran's reflex, maybe, oh, which yeah. Eric, I'm sure you would love. Anyway, Eric, how are I you would. doing? I'm doing good because I found my caramel cream. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't match my nails, but it'll have to do. <sighs> very good. Very good. Very, um, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, there we go. Uh, there we go. Here we go. It's, <laughs> it is. It's the reflex episode. Black, 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 um, black, black, black. <laughs> um, Joseph, how are you doing? Nile Rogers has produced this episode. <laughs> Joseph, are we there? Are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay. And I am doing well. You are. Good, good. Well, we're going to talk about um, your upcoming project in a minute. And Nathan, Nathan as well. But Nathan, how are you doing? Good. Okay, a man of few words, but... Um, I think that's what we'll have to be to avoid the stuttering. I know. Yes, yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> right, well, before we start, um, the Indigo- Indiegogo uh, campaign has started for Gory Graduation. So, Joseph and Nathan, do you want to talk a little bit about your plans and what uh, goodies you have for people to tempt them into backing your new movie? Um, well, uh, we have lots of goodies. Um, I'm trying to be very, um, selective with my words so I don't, ah, 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 that kind of thing. But, uh, uh, basically we're trying to raise, um, about 30 grand, which probably won't happen because you know how it goes, but, uh, we're hopeful. Um, we've been up for about a little over 24 hours and we're right at a thousand already. So we're doing fairly well. Um, let's see, uh, if you want to pick something for the show, uh, you have a chance. You can do that. Uh, there's posters, DVDs from Vinegar Syndrome, uh, movie credits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just look us up on Facebook. It's Gory Graduation. Um, we do have a meeting with an actual high school. Uh, we have an in there and, uh, we are fully cast, uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, we're just really looking forward to making the film. We hope uh, you know slasher fans will get behind us, as it were, and you know throw a little into the pot. And if you can't do that, just uh, send the link to everyone you know. Very good. And um, when are you hoping to start shooting, Nathan? Oh, sorry. Or well, Joseph? Oh, are you, uh, I didn't hear you say my name. Mm. We're still shooting for late summer. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Sounds sounds good. Well, lots of good perks there, and say um, it was very popular last time. People choosing uh, films to make us watch, and let's face it, it can't be as bad as Nathan's next pick. So do your worst, nothing for your best. Can. No. Um, so well, that's good. Well, you're going to keep us up to date, aren't you? In each 
show you know where you're where you're up to and um any developments so uh we shall look forward to that and also you've got the facebook page haven't you with lots of pre pre kind of shooting concept art oh yeah and um if you like any of that artwork you can pledge for it cool excellent well that's good and um yeah so I look forward to hearing a bit more about that but we are this episode our feature presentation is jeff liebman's just before dawn which i think was your pick eric wasn't it it is indeed yes okay so we will it's our four-year anniversary is it is it this one yes it is what is that is that um paper or lace or it's just before dawn (sighs) latex latex well yes that would be very appropriate um but uh, before we come on to that, we're going to have uh, a talking point from Nathan coming up, and we're going to discuss which of our, <coughs> I think it's which of our slasher franchises is the best. Is that right, Nathan? It doesn't necessarily have to be slasher, but okay. yes. Okay. Well, we'll do that. But before we do that, well, let's talk a little bit about what we've been watching over the last couple of weeks. So, Ooh. Joseph, would you like to go first? I would love to go first. Except I haven't really been watching a whole lot of horror films, unfortunately. Um, we got into uh, – someone mentioned this. I don't know if it was in a – I think it was in a past feedback. But uh, honestly, there's just not been a whole lot you know, out new. So uh, there's just nothing – not been a whole lot to watch. Okay. Well, short and sweet. Nathan, how about you? I watched uh, The Boy Next Door, the new Jennifer Lopez movie. Hmm. The thriller, I guess it's it's, and this is one I think just Joseph should definitely watch because it's one of those from hell movies and it follows oh, every I... from hell, yeah, it follows every from hell cliche that you can think of, but the movie is actually very entertaining. It's very ridiculous. It's you know I cracked up several times at scenes that are probably not supposed to be funny, and it's also got some great lines in it. Have you guys seen the trailer for it? Uh, no, I'm aware no. of it. I don't know if it's out. Well, yet, is it? like, okay, well, here, the gist of it, and this is not spoiler because it's just the way it is, but, you know, um, she's in, like, she's separated from her husband, and this, like, really hot young guy moves in next door, and he seems perfect in every way. And one night, one thing leads to another during a thunderstorm, and they end up having sex. And, of course, she wants to break it off, and he's a psychopath. But, um, like, she's trying to keep this secret from her ex husband because they're, they're Soon to be accepting they're thinking they're about getting back together. Um, and the guy has so many like funny one liners that are just so over the top. Like, you know, in one point they're all at the dinner table and um, she uh, she asked her husband because he was out of town with their son. She's like, Did it rain any where you were at? And he's like, No, it was dry as a bone. And then the psycho guy's like, Really? It was plenty wet here. <laughs> <laughs> It's just full of stupid lines like that. I love the movie. I thought it was very entertaining. Cool. Well, that sounds uh, sounds good. It'd be one to watch. Yeah, I heard it was very much like uh, said. If you wanted to watch a an updating of those kind of early nineties thrillers. Oh, it's it's definitely yeah. I mean, um, it really reminded me of uh, you know a lot of the like Hand That Rocks the Cradle and you know Paperboy and all and all like funny thrillers from those time frames okay cool all right well thank you nathan anything anything else uh no that's all i've been watching okay well eric what about you okay well i watched supernova which has just come out on uh, blu-ray from scream factory and uh this is a much maligned sci-fi horror movie from 2000 directed by thomas lee which is the pseudonym that directors use when they want their name removed from the credits but uh the original director we all know is walter hill uh then jack shoulder came in to do some reshoots and finally francis ford coppola did some tinkering during the editing process so it is very much a mishmash but having said that said that i really like the i really like the film um it's about a medical crew in deep space who answer a distress call uh, and rescue this sole survivor from a mining colony. And he has some um, day-glow alien in his possession with mystical powers. Um, it's, so it's a bit of a car crash of a movie, as you can expect from its troubled production history. But uh, I actually really, really enjoy it. I'm probably the only person in the world who does. Um, but uh, it has um, zero gravity sex in it, which is 
Mm, but, uh, there is some in Moon at the end of Moonraker, the James Bond movie, but I think that that's the the only zero gravity sex I've seen before or since. Um, and there's uh, on the Blu-ray actually there's uh, it, the special features are sparse, but there is a great behind the scenes uh, featurette where they discuss you know what went wrong and how the film was. Uh, basically being filmed before it was being written more or less uh so that was a, it's a thumbs up for me for supernova i know it's definitely one that that nathan wouldn't enjoy but um i don't know if you guys have seen it no no it's mm. one i i haven't i watched event horizon again for relatively recently mm. it wouldn't be t- dissimilar to event horizon mm. Mm. yeah no i don't what about you joseph have you seen it no, I've not seen Supernova, but I do love Event Horizon. That's an excellent film. Mm-hmm. No, it's a great film. But, um, yeah, super. Is it Angela Bassett? In- Angela Bassett, James Spader, um, the guy who played the bisexual guy on on My So Called Life is in there. Can't think of his name. Okay. Uh, so yeah, there's a decent cast in there, but uh, it's very silly but yeah. very entertaining and there's some great deleted scenes actually that would have made the film even better if they'd left them in I don't know why they were removed but hmm. uh, the other film I watched this week I think it's one that Joseph had mentioned a few months back you saw it in the theatres at uh, Ouija which is the the teen horror movie about a group of friends who try and contact uh, a girl that they all know who's recently committed suicide um, they use the Ouija board the title and are subsequently hunted down by this mysterious force um, and uh, I mean, the film has been getting quite meh reviews. Joseph, you had seen it, hadn't you? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I went. I was expecting it to be dull, but uh, I was surprised that I found it relatively entertaining. Now, I say relatively entertaining. It's not something I'd watch again, and I don't think I would recommend it. But what I did like about it was that the victim's demises are quite eerie and effective. What happens is their eyes go completely white, like the possessed people in The Evil Dead, uh, their mouths appear sewn shut, and then they just kind of evaporate in this cloud of dust, much like in the US remake of Pulse, uh, that the Japanese movie from the, the mid-2000s. Mm. Uh, it was quite quite lightweight, but as I said, I went in expecting it to be awful, and it turned out to be mildly entertaining, and I certainly enjoyed it much more than The Babadook in terms of new releases. So uh, Ouija, not one to recommend, but I don't think it's as awful as I thought it was going to be. Okay, well, you're probably the I lone critic, it. aren't you, Eric, who preferred... Sorry? You're probably the lone critic who preferred Ouija to the Babadook. No, but I, I, I think... Oh, well, to preferred it to the Babadook, yeah, but yeah. I didn't, Nathan chimed in there saying he liked Ouija. Mm-hmm. I, I liked it. Um, I don't... I mean, I'm like Eric, you know, I don't think it's one I'm ever going to rewatch. but it's one of those movies where I don't think it was boring. I just thought it was really bad, but by bad, I meant, like, funny bad, like... I don't want to spoil anything, but Eric, do you remember the final battle at the end when a certain character suddenly returns to help? Yes. It is so stupid <laughs> and, and funny. And I was I was about to laugh till I cried over that scene. Mm. Yeah. And there's a good head bashing on a sink scene as well that was kind of silly. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds, I shall uh, get that out at some point, but uh, anything else? Uh, I watched The Guest, but I think you're probably going to talk about that, are you? It's one that Joseph and Nathan recommended to us. Yes. Okay. Well, let's talk about that now, um, because do you want to... Put your opinion well, yeah, it's, it's a, well. It, it was very much in the in the mold of those from hell movies that uh, Nathan was just talking about. I I found um, I probably didn't like it as much as Joseph and Nathan did. Although <gasps> I was, no, I, but I did like it. I did think it was really really entertaining. Um, it is as as you say. It's for me. I wouldn't class it as a horror movie. It's one. It's one of those from hell thriller movies where. Um, and I can completely see where you you were saying something like he was supposed to be channeling Robert Patrick from Terminator 2 in his performance, and I could certainly see that. I think the last 15 minutes are terrific, where it's it's all set in not a funhouse, but a, a school gymnasium that's been set up to look like a funhouse for a prom or for a school disco or something. Uh, and it's re- that's where the Dario Argento comparisons come in with all the uh, surreal lighting and weird effects. Uh, highly, highly entertaining, and I would highly recommend it. It's not one I, I would probably end up buying myself, but um, uh, I did enjoy it, yes. What did you think, Justin? Yeah, well, I, I, to be honest, I was um, I wouldn't say I was disappointed. I think my expectations were too high for it. So it, 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 um, I, I thought it was very well made, but to be honest, I'd, if for rewatchability, I would watch your next over the guests. Um mm. 
I, d- I did like it and I liked the, the whole 80s feel to it and it was very well done uh, but um, uh, and I think you uh, Nathan and Joseph did w- warn us that it wasn't really a slasher movie even though it had been yeah. painted mm-hmm. as such in, in some circles so so I think that coloured coloured it. I mean, I thought it was it was yeah, it was very well done. Um, I didn't really get, and maybe I just wasn't paying attention closely enough, w- what he was actually doing there um, beyond his original, you know, saying he was going to uh, pay his respects to the family. Um, yeah, I don't of, understand what his goal was either. No, yeah. well, it, his goal. But well, I don't want to spoil it. Like I. I feel like if I'm giving you his goal, we're kind of spoiling some twists in that movie. Well, tell, um, us, okay. tell us after. Yeah, we, I'll t- we'll, we'll, we'll talk after we were finished recording. Okay. I did really like the lead female, the sort of, quote, final girl in the movie. Her little brother uh, might have needed a slap at times, but, um, yeah. yeah, she was really uh, a well, good character. He did get beat up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, then he got his desserts, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But no, I thought I thought Dan. Uh, it must have been quite surreal watching Dan Stevens go from uh, Downton Abbey to um, to the guest. I haven't. I never watched Downton Abbey. But uh, oh, he was. I mean, he was one of like a very proper, you know, kind of British guy on Downton Abbey because he was one of the rich family members. Hmm. So, is he a British he, actor? Um, yes. yes, he is. All right. He was doing a. He said that for this role, he had his friend who's from Kentucky basically read out loud to him, and he was trying to mimic that accent. Hmm. I thought he did a really good job. Yeah, yeah. I, he did, I would never have guessed he was British yeah. if I didn't know. Hmm. So, well, that was a guess. So, I'd, I'd recommend it. It was. It just. Um, as I say I think I preferred your next out of. Yeah, the, I would prefer your next as well. But I, yeah. as I, you know, I think we all agreed that The Guest was a highly entertaining movie. Yeah. Absolutely. And another, but I think you guys need to try what he did. You need mm. to try a southern US What, accent. killing? Killing people? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. What, do, try an accent like that? Yeah, you need to like do like him and do like a whole podcast with a different accent. I'm really bad at accents. No, you're not, Justin. Go on, do one. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, we won't yeah. we won't laugh. No, honest. I will I will try and practice honest. one for next time. How about that? But what I was going to talk, there was another film that I saw, which we've spoken about at some length, so I won't go on about too much, which was The Purge Anarchy. Um, oh, yes. Finally caught up with that. And again, I still I was, haven't seen that. No. I was a little bit disappointed in it, if I'm honest. I thought um, I thought it was it was fun. If, if anything, I thought the, the first film was more like a, a modern thriller, whereas I thought the sequel was very much like an 80s action movie. And that in itself isn't a bad thing at all, obviously. But it was, it, it kind of, it, it, I, I didn't find it, um, it was an action movie, whereas the first film was a horror movie. Uh, and I think that was a, a distinction. Um, I thought the, the sequel kind of lost that kind of edge. Although, to be honest, it was probably in some ways more entertaining. It's if you um, put your brain on neutral and watch it and just think you're watching an 80s you know, sort of Italian action, you know, um, video, you know, a VHS release from 1983, then, you know, or a Mad Max ripoff, then that that's the way to watch it. But um, I, I, I kind of miss the slightly more macabre uh, elements of the first film, although they're still there. It's, it's a bit more cartoonish. So... I don't know if that's a fair assessment, but that's how I how I felt felt. No, I'm. I would agree because you know, I mean, the first one is more of a horror than the second. You know, the second's a very suspense action, like you said. Hmm. Um, the one scene that I loved is uh, the one where you know, Justin they they hide out at the apartment hmm. of some friends of the yeah. one woman's. Yeah. And it's one of those situations where everything's going normal, but something's going to happen, but you don't know what and who's going to be the one to to basically do something. It was kind of clever piece of misdirection, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. it was. Yeah. So, so that was good. Um, just rattling through a few others. There's a film um, that uh, Patrick from Scream Queens uh, mentioned he'd watched um, and piqued my interest, and it's a. Uh, a found footage movie called, well, not a found footage, but it's a, a, a type of found footage movie called The Conspiracy. Um, has anyone seen it? I have. No. Oh, you have. Okay. So, you, yes. Yeah. Um, it's it's basically, I, it was quite an intriguing premise. It's this idea of these documentary filmmakers 
are following or interviewing this conspiracy theorist who has all these way out you know he just thinks basically sees a conspiracy in absolutely everything so it was they're making a documentary about truthers you know people who are constantly looking for what they term is the truth like things like 9 11 and all sorts of things um and then uh the guy they're interviewing vanishes and they go out to try and find um uh find well not find out where where he is more so much as they take all of his um research and try and piece it together to try and work out what he was getting at and um they discover this um shadowy um group of businessmen uh who who meet and every time they meet there's a global there's something like 9 11 or or some or like the stock market crashes or anything like that so they find this conspiracy and they try and infiltrate this kind of secret group and it kind of follows them through and the thing it kind of works it's i i actually really liked it i thought it was really well done and um but it plays with the whole thing about is it really conspiracy or is it not and it oscillates between yes it is no it isn't yes it is and it's um yeah i thought it's quite clever what did you think joseph oh i uh i i agree with you um i love i love the build-up but i love the last uh you know 20 minutes even more i think um that's some of the best suspense I've I've seen in any in any film in a long time. Hmm. Um, what I did like about the film, and uh, I guess this isn't really major spoilers, but it's just kind of light spoilers, is that um, you know there's two guys doing the documentary, and um, I like the idea that one they're both kind of like oh you know conspiracies uh, they're you know they're just what they are as conspiracies, but one of the guys basically just kind of becomes the guy they're interviewing because he starts believing these conspiracies so much i like that angle to the film yeah it's i I really like the way it kind of like say oscillated between the it's no it actually is a conspiracy and oh no actually no it's not and at the end of the movie you're still not really sure what Mm. what's happened and i thought that was that was quite clever so that was that was a recommend um the uh the other last night we had a had a creature double feature uh, a, a double bill of the uninvited uh, Graydon Clark's uh, mutant cat on a yacht with 80s um, teenagers movie. Which, and George Kennedy. And from George Kennedy Gordon. and Clue Gallagher. And the other guy, his name I can't remember, but um, which is one of my favourite um, knowingly bad movies, I kind of guess. Mm. Uh, so if you've never seen The Uninvited, um, then the, I think it's from 87, 86, 87, um, but it's um, got basically a glove puppet uh, attacking teenagers on a on a yacht, and one of the worst the worst model boats sinking since um, Humongous. <laughs> but um, there was that, and also on a double bill with Empire of the Ants, which the Joan Collins Ooh, in polyester yeah. being attacked by giant ants, um, which is which is you know a really fun movie, isn't it? It's not really a horror movie as such, but it's uh, like a classic seventies kind of adventure sort of with horror elements but i would um, call it a horror movie well i could guess it, it is it's still it's not particularly horrific is it i mean i mean it's not like a, it's not a gore it's it's no you know it's not like grizzly or one of the other kind of more horror but the, the uh, i thought it, you know it's a it's a very entertaining movie um and you can see joan collins all the way thinking i need to fire my agent <laughs> although having said that she was making films like the stud and the bitch wasn't she at that time um, mm. and come through in the 1970s by making th- um, dwarf uh, sort of sex dwarf films like I Don't Want to Be Born and things like that so so maybe she actually relished being attacked by giant ants I don't know but yeah that was that was a fun <laughs> film have you Eric and Nathan presumably you are familiar with that that movie oh yes I have both on DVD yeah mm. Mm. big fan of both excellent um, excellent and also, I love Joan Collins she she was very she was uh, very intelligent. She was quite bitchy in it and uh, got a comeuppance. But uh, I um, and to finish the evening off, um, Argento came in from outside uh, with a shitty bottom as a, a stop to the, the evening. So I had to chase him around the house with a wet wipe. So anyway, that's oh. how we that's how we roll in our house. <laughs> so. <laughs> I didn't need to know that. Well, I know. I just thought I'd, I'd let you know. I hope he case, flushed the toilet after him. Well, he's he's trying to get in at the moment. It's like being in like a nineties, one of those nineties thrillers, because he's outside the door, kind of scratching, trying to get in. But I know if I let him in, he'll eat my headphones. So I can't. 
So anyway, it's, a, it's like a Salvador Dali painting in your house. <laughs> what an asshole! <laughs> yeah, well, he t- unfortunately he does. We have to get these pet wipes because he quite often comes in, um, you know, looking a bit. Uh, <laughs> I feel sick. <laughs> Um, anyway, let's 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 move yeah. on from my cat's incontinence um, issues to uh, Nathan's talking point of the week. Oh yes, yes. Um, I look forward to hearing what you guys have chosen. Um, basically, I'm wondering, and like I said, this can be horror, but what horror like series of films overall? And I mean, series of films being in more than one sequel. Um, do you think is just collectively the best? The best. For me, I just heard myself. Um, for me, uh, I go with the Slumber Party Massacre series because I can't even tell you which one I love the most because I really feel that they're all equally amazing. I love every single one of them. I mean, um, they're classic slasher films. You know, um, they've got everything that I look for in a slasher film. You know, um, and I love the drill as a murder weapon. And, you know, every movie uses the drill like they 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 do not try to go away from the formula. And that's why I like those movies. It's a driller killer using his drill on girls at a slumber party. We don't have to get anything above and beyond that, even though the sequel does get kind of kooky. You know, it still follows that formula, too. So I still love it just as equally. Okay. Mind and you, I'm I mean, curious, hmm. did somebody else talk or am I hearing myself again? No, I was just going to say, I was going to say okay. that I thought, for me, I couldn't think of a sequel that was more out there than Slum Party uh, Massacre Part 2. Um, the uh, the, the Exorcist 2? Well, well, I'm talking about from a slasher. Oh, but, sorry. Yeah, okay. sorry, yeah, but for, for horror, then um, then yes, certainly with that. But it's kind of taking what was the first film's kind of very much based in a kind of reality, isn't it? Although it's... You know, well, it is a. Re- it's kind of based in reality. Was the sequel is very much not. It's, uh, but um, but it's good. Good choice, Nathan. And also because there's only three, re- in really, isn't there? And ultimately, only three films in the, the series. Yeah. It hasn't didn't get, have too much of a chance to fuck it all up. Well, and uh, I did think the last Slumber Party was like a fourth sequel to it when I finally watched it, but I realized that it's its own movie. Yes, thankfully. It is. is well, I mean, it, it's good. I mean, if they could have used a drill in it, then it would have been a welcome addition, but they used a scalpel. A scalpel and um, a, a thimble full of fake blood. I think it was. <laughs> so what about you, Justin? Well, I thought long and hard about this. Um, <laughs> did you? Mm, um, but to be honest, I'm going to be very Catholic in my choices, if you can call uh, calling the Friday the 13th see, um, a series a kind of Catholic choice. Um, I, I tried to think of things because I know people are t- choosing other other things, and I thought, well, Halloween after I, I'm not a huge fan of part four and five, regardless, and six and onwards. I mean, they're they're watchable, you know. Don't get me wrong. Um, Night on Elm Street again, past parts three and me and four, I'm not particularly interested apart from like New Nightmare. Uh, you know, it very much went off the boil for me. Whereas the Friday the 13th series, I think, had the longest of uh, a good run, basically, um, up to even even uh, Jason Takes Manhattan is entertaining in its own way. I mean, after that, it kind of you know, lost its lost its way. But I think for rewatchability for me, the Friday the 13th sequels from you know um, from two to six say are the ones i would have watched um the most even you know i found a kind of grudging uh you know um um not acceptance but uh um affection for part five perhaps so, <gasps> you know I, I can enjoy it more i still don't think it's a good film i don't think it's a good friday <gasps> good sequel but it's entertaining in its own its own right so um so friday 13th series is probably out of all of the horror series is the is the most consistently entertaining for me. So there you go. Yeah, then I should say that was going to be my original choice until I thought of the Slumber Party movies because, like you said, Friday the Thirteenth had the longest run of being consistently entertaining. Mm. Um, to me, it wasn't until they tried to get crazy in the nineties with it that I lost interest. Yeah. Um, so what about you, uh, Joseph? 
Well, um, I was originally going to go with Friday the 13th as well, but uh, if we're talking about just consistency, um, you know, like you said, after, uh, I'd say after, you know, Jason takes Manhattan, they it, they did lose its way. So I'm going with the Final Destination films, which um, I've liked every single one. Um, this one, uh, I like a little less than the rest, but I still like it. But, you know, I think it's a very consistent series. It's, it's you know, wildly entertaining and graphic and gory and just a lot of, you know, silly kind of high thrills, popcorn fun. Um, they haven't let me down yet, and uh, I, I, I kind of wish they'd, you know, make a sixth film. Maybe they will someday, but, uh, you know, so far, as far as movies that, have a good film in every single one, every single film in the series, I'd say a uh, final destination for me. Okay. Yeah. Good choice. I love those movies and I love the uh, fifth one. You know, I'm not going to spoil it for anybody, but the, the ending to the fifth one uh, I thought was very clever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what about you, Eric? Hmm. Well, Final Destination, I would have to totally agree with, because uh, all five films are incredibly watchable. Having said that, I only own one of them, and that that happens to be part four, uh, mainly because it it was out around the time I first got a Blu-ray player, and, and I just purchased it then. It came with uh, 3D glasses, so uh, the anaglyph ones, so you could watch it without it necessarily having a 3D television. Uh, but yeah, all five of those are really consistent. But I'm going to have to side with uh, Justin on this one. I, I was, I'll have to say Friday the 13th, mainly because I find parts one to eight really rewatch. Uh, Rewatchable, more so parts one to four, which I can watch on a loop really uh, and never tire of. Five, six, seven, eight. Um, if I'm in the right mood, I can really, really, uh, well, I can quite enjoy. Uh, nine, ten, and Freddy versus Jason, uh, I wouldn't be terribly fond of. And they do kind of, you know, sour things a little for the Friday the 13th series and the remake as well. Obviously, it's ghastly. But um, yeah, in terms of. Uh, you know, certainly parts one to four, they didn't, uh, you know, they found a winning formula and they didn't bother shifting away from it at all, which is what I really admire about them. So, yeah, Friday the 13th for me. It's always a good choice. It makes me wonder, um, as far as the classic horror series, what movie in them is the one that made you not pick it? As in, like, for me, like, Halloween, you know, I love one and two and I find three to be entertaining, but part four would be the one that kind of threw it off for me. Yeah, exactly. You I know? completely agree. Yeah. Four is, I, I find four more or less unwatchable as, and I love one, two and three, but there's no sequel that compares to them really after that. So, yeah, I agree. And Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, I love one, two and three and four has its moments, but part five is, I mean, I still like it, but it's really out there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like part five as well. It's part six that really uh, does nothing for me. And also, I'm probably yeah, the only person in the world. I don't, I don't like New Nightmare. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I You've know. You've said that before, Eric, and we've, yeah. we've, everyone's taken a collective gasp. Yes, I know. <laughs> I don't think New Nightmare is as good as everyone says it is, but I, I like it. But I prefer the first... Uh, three films in that series overall four like nathan said has its moments but boy five is where they really started you know kind of dropping the ball with freddie i I mean i i admit i still like five it's just you know it 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 doesn't it's not as it doesn't hold up as well to me as the others and then part six is where it really goes off the the rails Mm. Mm. um I did wonder about because I've not seen part six since I saw it at the cinema. Mm. Uh, no, it hasn't aged when, well at all. Uh, believe me, it didn't mm. age. It, it looked. It didn't age particularly well back then. Even when it no. just came out, it was. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, especially the that kind of the 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 sorriest excuse for three D um, at the mm. end. You know that was that was that was a real cheap trick, really, wasn't it? Mm. But it is. It's an awful film, and it's just it's boring. Mm. Yeah. yeah it's a shame it's i think they just um I, you know i i read um the um what's it called well the uh robert england autobiography that came out a few years ago while i was on holiday last summer and it was surprising actually how cheap those movies were even when they were making you know 40 50 60 million dollars at the box office that um he said even then they were they were still 
really cheap shoots compared to a lot of other films that have been coming out at the time. Uh, <laughs> and um, and it, 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 you feel, for me, it's, um, at least for Friday 13th, you've got a set thing, you get kids in the woods and you kill them. You can do that relatively cheaply and you don't have to have big splashy uh, special effects. But with the Night on Elm Street season uh, series, it felt like they, you know, they literally ran out of steam because they were making one every single year uh, pretty much just to keep the keep the cash cow going, and um, you know, in you know, it just basically Freddie got sillier and sillier, didn't he? So till he became a cartoon character, and there was only one way for that to end, really, wasn't there? And so, yeah, um, <laughs> in tears, oh, I, in tears, yeah. <laughs> I should say that um, you know, Sleepaway Camp. Um, if the fourth one did not exist, it would have been a very close contender. The series would be with Slumber Party Massacre for me. Because I love the first three, but mm. uh, the fourth one just ruined it. Mm. Well, well, fair enough. Okay, well, that was um, Nathan's alg- alg- algorithm table of the week. Algonquin. <laughs> That's the one. Um, so, no, thank you, Nathan. Anything else you'd like to say on, on your talking points? I love horror movies. Okay, well, thank you for that. So, I think it's probably time for us to go into the backwoods of Oregon. What do you think? I think so. Okay. Five friends set out for a weekend camping excursion to drink, frolic and skinny dip on an isolated piece of land one of them has inherited. Despite ominous warnings from local forest ranger, brackets George Kennedy, airport death ship, strange backwoods families and a hollering drunken hunter, brackets Justin Kurzweil, the hysteria continues, claiming to have witnessed his friend's evisceration by the hands of demons, they trek further into the foliage. Beautifully shot, extremely eerie, and with a horrifying twist that will make you wonder, will any of them survive those dark hours just before dawn? That's uh, the blurb from the uh, Blu-ray of uh, Just Before Dawn, which was released, I think, last year by Code Red. Um, Just Before Dawn has been a favourite of mine since seeing it in the late 80s. Uh, I adore this movie. Its plot, like many of my favourite slashers, is really basic. Uh, But Just Before Dawn benefits from having a great cast, a great director, whose previous work uh you know would also rank as some of my favorite horror movies so these firm and blue sunshine uh oops uh, and possibly one of the most spectacularly gorgeous backdrops ever seen in a slasher movie um i always remember the film as being quite graphic uh but in retrospect watching it again uh this week uh really only the oddly named Vachel's death at the start is the one true moment of gore when he gets a large serrated machete to the groin. Um, And the fisting finale is quite a sight, of course, and possibly maybe bends the rules of reality a bit and believability, but it's it's not gory as such. In fact, uh, you know, thinking back, a lot of these slasher movies from the golden era era seem really tame, especially when you compare them to things like the Hatchet series that, that, you know, are around at the moment, which is just wall to war, blood and guts. Wall to wall, blood and guts even. Um, the other thing I love about the film is the minimalist score by Brad Fidel. Fidel sorry. Uh, it's one of his earliest assignments. Of course, he went on to, you know, superstardom with the Terminator series. Um, and Jeff Lieberman is quoted as saying that he wanted to rely mostly on the sounds of nature and less on, on music. Uh, and I think that's a masterstroke because it really does create that out in the woods, miles from civilization kind of ambience. You know, and when the music does come in, it has this eerie uh, chanting and this sort of whistle sound on it. And it's really, really superb. Uh, in terms of the characters, I absolutely love the character of Megan. And I think Nathan will probably um, agree with me on this one. I just love her sort of carefree, cheerleaderish approach to life. You know, her obsession with makeup and, you know, her exclamations of, all right, I found my caramel cream. Oh, darling, that Cadillac red is simply you. Um, you know, and I adore her scene in the graveyard with Daniel where they're taped doing the photo shoot and they're interrupted, um, you know, by who they think is Jonathan, but actually turns out to be uh, one of the two killers. Spoiler alert. Uh, and to make him jealous, she goes, oh, Daniel, take me, take me right here in the graveyard. <gasps> Reminds me of Justin. Um, and Deborah Benson as Connie is, is one you of my favourite. <laughs> Ooh, I haven't heard that in a while. Um, Deborah Benson as Connie is one of my favourite final girls. I think she's channeling a bit of Amy Steele there, even though, I mean, the film was made before Friday the 13th Part 2, from what I can find out. Um, she starts out as this sort of self-confessed, you know, sissy when faced with danger, but ends up as this feistly, you know, Ripley from Alien style character. Um, utterly brilliant, quite eerie in places, 
not terribly bloody, but still being quite violent. And it still manages to have that 1981 popcorn slasher feel, in in my opinion, anyway. So it, it's not nasty enough to be, you know, disturbing as such. Uh, so a classic, in my opinion, uh, up there with uh, Friday the 13th Part 2, Happy Birthday to Me, My Bloody Valentine, all those classics from 81. This is up there with it. Uh, Joseph, would you agree? I would wholeheartedly agree. Yay. Uh, no, Just Before Dawn is a, you know, a fantastic film. I think, um, you know, what sets it apart from a lot of the backwoods slasher films from the time is definitely, uh, you know, the direction and the backdrop. And um, I kind of like the idea of uh, these people going into the, you know, into the mountains to kind of camp, you know, as it, as they usually do. Um, I like the idea that they set up this whole kind of, uh, well, I guess it's, I guess it's foreshadowing because they go in there and they're like, there sure is a lot of twins around here. And, um, and he's like, you know, it's inbreeding and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, it just, le- it, le- it lends credence to that whole kind of, you know, plot twist halfway through is when they're at the, uh, they're at the graveyard and they reveal that there's actually two of these, you know, big behemoth killers. And it's, it's really quite shocking. Um, you know, when I first saw the film, I knew nothing about it except that it was, you know, a backwoods slasher film. Um, you know, in this day and age, if, uh, you'd never seen just before it on, you would have that little, uh, plot point ruined for you, especially if you're listening to this episode. But if you're listening to this episode, you shouldn't be, you should have already seen the film. But anyway, um, I really did love that plot twist when I saw it. Cause I, you know, I knew nothing about it. Um, like I said, I, I like the backdrop. I think uh, you know Lieberman and his crew. They they really do capture the uh, the woods probably better than any other slasher film I've seen. And um, I like the cast. I, I do like the kind of uh, the twist between uh, Connie and uh, her boyfriend, played by Greg Henry. You know, he's the Warren. Yeah, Warren. Uh, he's the uh, you know he's the male. He's the hero, and she's the you know, the girl he's going to save, but at the end it's him kind of, uh, whimpering and crying, you know, off in a corner somewhere while she just basically, you know, takes down this, um, this guy who's probably like six foot taller than she is. And that, that fisting finale really is something, uh, to behold. Um, the one thing I, mm. the one it's, thing would you that, say, the, sorry, I was going to say, would you say the fisting finale was better than in Anal Paprika three? <laughs> Well, your his mouth is not quite as wide open as some orifice on your body, but um, I wasn't in Anil Paprika three. You yes, you were. In, admit you were it. At Thirteen, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, one thing about this film that's kind of curious to me is um, uh, George Kennedy. His name is Roy McLean, but he's not lean. He's he's the opposite of lean, isn't he? Yes, but no, seriously, uh, all, in all seriousness, uh, just before dawn, you know, it really is probably, if not the best backwoods slasher film ever made, it's it's right up there. It's, you know, it's gorgeous to look at, you know, it's well-directed, well-acted. It even has a Blondie song on the soundtrack, so, I mean, you can't really go wrong anywhere. Mm, love a bit of Blondie. Yeah. Nathan, over to you. Um, I absolutely love Heart of Glass. And I do love that they use that uh, song in the film. Um, no, I love Just Before Dawn. I thought it starts out very creepy. You know, I thought the scene is in the abandoned church, especially when he looks up and sees the killer staring. I, I mean, that that's a very creepy scene, mm, you yeah. know. Um, and of course, like you said, I mean, the, the machete to the groin, especially since they go the extra step of just showing it come out, <laughs> you know. Come out of the guy, you know. I mean, yeah, it looks extremely painful. The sound um, effects in that scene are really good too, because you can hear it like, yes. just sliding in. And he's just, like, uh, uh. It's yeah, it's, uh, it's awful. Um, but no, I mean, I, I love the film. You know, I, I I love woods. You know, the woods is a setting for um, movies anyway, and so I think they did a really good job of making the woods seem very creepy and secluded. You know. Uh, you know, Jeff Lieberman did a great job with that. Um, I've always been fascinated with the character of uh, Connie, you know, just because throughout the movie, she's more tomboyish. And then at the end, when she actually, you know, faces the killer, you know, she's like, she looks very feminine, 
you know, like it's kind of like her transformation throughout the film as well. Mm. And I thought it was very fascinating that the director, you know, kind of went that route with her. Uh, but it definitely makes her a more memorable heroine. And yes, Eric's right. Of course, I love Jamie Rose in this movie. I think she's fantastic. Um, and I, actually, I love all the characters in the movie, you know. Um, I thought, you know, it's, it's very well written. And I watched this with Grant Grant years ago. And the scene where, um, you know, uh, Jamie Rose and uh, Christopher Lemon are in the uh, water together and you see the killer like um, behind the waterfall come into the water. Greg about fell out of his chair when that scene happened. He was like, oh, my God, did you see that? Did you see that? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I love the, the twist. And, you know, I guess we kind of already spoiled it. But I love the twist of, you know, the, they're, they're twins. And, you know, you think you've gotten one of them and really the other one was still there. You know, that was a, it was a great little twist in the movie. Um, let's see. I mean, I really, Oh, the soundtrack. That's what else I wanted to mention. I love the the soundtrack to this movie. It's, it's you know, it just adds to the atmosphere in the film. And did you guys notice uh, at the beginning, um, they even mention uh, twins. It's kind of foreshadowing when yeah. they're driving up and, you know, Ralph Seymour sees the the twins and, you know, he, he even asked like, why are there so many twins up here? And it's just kind of like laughed off by the group. And I thought it was neat to kind of put that in as a way to foreshadow what's going to happen. I did uh, mention just that. mention that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, I apologize that I might've missed that. Mm. Um, now, our voices sound so much alike. I thought that that was me talking. It was <laughs> in your heads. <laughs> yeah, but I agree with Nathan too. You know, he. Uh, I like that scene in the movie. You also have to remember it's very, very early here. It yes, is. it is. Yes. It's, it's and I did not sleep last night. We're not quite awake, and I'm at work, so uh, yeah, we're out of it. <laughs> but uh, okay, so I agree with Joseph. Uh, that that's the bottom line there. Yes. Did anyone notice the foreshadowing at the beginning where Ralph is taking pictures of the twins and he notices that um, there are a lot of twins around there? No, I didn't see that. No? I don't remember that Alan scene. Dale was in Neighbours. <laughs> I was about to say that. You stole it. That could be, this could be our new Alan Dale's in Neighbours line. We haven't used yep. that in so long. Oh, oh and, and it, could, it could also take the place of the girl with the giant hair that gets turned into a cockroach. I love her. All Justin jokes. Mm. Yeah, Justin. What yes, did you think well, of just before dawn? I Justin would, before dawn. Just, be- oh, just yeah. before dawn. Yes, very good, very good. <laughs> That's probably going to be better than Eric's joke of the week, but we should hey. wait. To, well, we'll see, we'll see. But yeah, no, I, I think it's going to be a unanimous thumbs up all across the board. I think because um, I've always loved just before dawn, and I I would agree that it's it's one of the best. Slash movies of 1981. In fact, it's probably one of the. I would say it's probably in my top ten slash movies of the early 80s or the golden age of the slash movie. So I think it's it's that good. Um, it's a film. It, it was obviously. Uh, I think because uh, I interviewed Jeff Lieberman many years ago. In fact, he's in fact he's the first person uh, I interviewed for Hysteria Lives Lives. Um, and he he basically denied uh, he'd seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre, although he he was, did base the rewritten re- re- script on Deliverance a little bit. Um, but film, I thought it actually had felt more like was Rituals, um, mm. of having that slightly kind of the weird, you know, the whole kind of other other worldly feel to the woods. Um, and I think it is all down to the soundtrack, uh, pretty much, and the gorgeous cinematography, because that whole uh, chanting kind of weird sort of and the whistle and everything is quite it it just gives that feeling of kind of awe and spookiness you feel genuinely when you're in the woods which you don't get in a film like Friday 13th that's the Friday 13th is the archetypical backwards slasher movie but the woods themselves are kind of incidental rather than a character uh, of it, they they the woods aren't creepy in Friday 13th whereas they they are in uh, just before dawn um, I think it's, it's. I mean, you've spoken about all the, the uh, you know, the standout scenes. The, uh, I mean, the, the the waterfall scene, the the killing uh, in the graveyard, and also the fisting at the end, which is is just so 
out of left field, isn't it? And I think for audiences watching this when this came out would have been, they wouldn't really have, you know, I mean, they'd seen Alice chop off the head of Mrs. Voorhees at the end of Friday 13th, but this took it to another level, another level um, uh, which I thought was really clever. But then that's Jeff Lieberman all over, isn't it? All of his films have a, a certain sort of other sense. They're very, he's, he's very, he's very, um, uh, individualistic, um, or what's the word for it? He's just very, he's, he's kind of, um, he's, he's sets himself apart from other directors. Um, because essentially the, the characters in this are your typical spam and a wagon, uh, teenagers off to the woods to be killed one by one. But everything else in the film is, you know, and you've got the crazy Ralph character in, in George Kennedy, who, we, you know, is basically aping crazy Ralph, although ironically. Mike Kellen, do you think? Do you mean? No, not not so much. No, because I'm talking. Well, the the Mike Kellen as well, but also um, when George Kennedy says, you know, tell me, you know, at least tell me where you're going. And, you oh know, yeah, yeah. And saying don't come, you know, don't go there, you know, don't go into the woods. But um, I mean, the film. I think the film was being shot as Friday Thirteenth was released in 1980, so it's probably coincidental um, with this. Although maybe they added bits and pieces in. I, I don't know the the exact thing, but. Um, but yeah, no, it's. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great film, and it's a way to actually have giggling killers who are actually quite scary, and menacing. Um, uh, you know, I think the um, John Hunsaker as the as the twins. Uh, you know, it was a, it you know gave a great performance for what was really a kind of a, you know, a one note kind of char- characters. They were just giggling monsters basically, but mm. um, they also were quite creepy. Um, cause on the, on the interviews, on the, uh, the edition I've got, they said about shaving off his eyebrows to give him a massive forehead. Um, so lots of things to make him look a bit weird, but yeah, it's, it's a great film. I think it's, um, it works as a teen slasher movie, you know, through and through, but it's also, it's a lot more than that as well. And I think, um, uh, that's why it's it's so watchable because I think Jeff Lieberman, when he's been interviewed, said that it's not that it's not actually that violent a movie as you were saying, Eric, when you rewatched it. Surprisingly, few deaths, isn't there really? And the, it's the 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 first death um, and also the death in the graveyard really are the the most violent scenes in the movie. But it's it's certainly no Friday Thirteenth when it comes to gore, um, mm. and there's long periods where there nothing. Not nothing happens, but there, you know, there's there's no gore or violence. But it's a good enough film to keep your attention through and through. So um, yeah, thumbs up all round. Who, whoever came up with the idea of having the uh, the killers giggle like um, Mutley from Wacky Races was genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. You could also um, mm. you could read into the film that the twins are targeting their victims for specific reasons because. Do you think it's just a coincidence that uh, at the start, uh, is it Ty is his name, and Vachel have just killed a deer, and on their way up to the to the campsite, the uh, five kids in the wagon accidentally knock over a deer and kill it. Um, mm. Did anyone think that might have been a? Because I mean, the, the the deer killing really has nothing else to do with the plot of the movie. So I'm just wondering if if maybe the intention was to imply that these were sort of this was nature takes revenge in the form of these twins possibly no? it hadn't, hadn't occurred to me but um i mean you could read that into it i mean i think jeff lieberman was saying that the um uh they were just meant to be not evil but they were um had been so inbred and everything that they they were just just kind of killing for kicks basically and there wasn't an evil thing it's just it's like their way of hunting mm-hmm. um I don't. In some ways, it's kind of difficult to know because the. the I'm sure you, you talk a bit more about the background in a minute, but the, it's, it's Jeff Lieberman completely rewrote the script, didn't he? Um, uh, so yeah. whether or not how much, uh, you know, thought went into all of it, or it was just literally taking the, the bare bones of the script of, you know, I think he was told you can make whatever film you want as long as you. Um, follow the formula of sending teenagers into the forest or early twenty somethings and killing them. Um, but no, it's an interesting thing. It's I, I don't know. I mean, certainly they were. He was t- he was talking about how it was kind of um, he was aping kind of uh, kind of uh, kind of that kind of um, 
uh, sort of culture, not the kind of primitive culture of taking uh, the token or something from somebody you've killed. Because the twins, every time they kill somebody, they take something from them, don't they? Like the hat, yeah. From the, mm. the and then the whistle and the camera, um, uh, and it was almost like everything was all, it was all a joke to them, perhaps. Um, but yeah, no, it's do an ra- interesting point. Mm. Mm. Do raccoons really steal makeup? I don't know. Was she, the the woman who stole the makeup wasn't very good at putting it on, was it? She looked like Toya. no. She looked like she she was shot by Homer Simpson's makeup gun. Yeah, mm. like Toya. Um, Shut at you. <laughs> um, if you push me too far, I'm going to throw myself out the window. Oh, yeah, Toya looks like a clown whore. Okay, jump, I'm going jump. to throw myself out the window now. I'm going jump, over to jump, the window. Jump. I'm go- You're not to try and stop me. You're not to try and stop me, Justin. I'm going are you to on the first floor? Out. Are you on the ground floor? No, I'm on the fourth floor. You're on the fourth floor? Mm. Okay. Yeah, just open no, the window now. Eric, don't. Try- stop. <laughs> I'm going to do it. You're not to stop me. Eric, Justin, we can't. You're not to stop me. Okay. No, um, anyway, what were you talking about? You're not about? to stop um, me. <laughs> Eric, this will come. This is a cry for help. Eric, don't jump. I hate you. <laughs> do it. No, I wasn't. Anyway, <gasps> Eric, just think about your fans. Yeah, I know. Millions of them out there. Yeah, they'd be very upset if you threw, if you tossed yourself off. So, um, <laughs> well, you've got, you, you've got your love Ooh. beads, haven't you? You've got anal love beads to keep you company, so that's always good. Um, <gasps> How dare you? What? Mm. How dare mm. you? What's Eric just sent yeah. a rude message to you? No. No, no, I said, how dare you, because you mentioned anal beads. That, this is a family podcast. <laughs> it's hardly. Well, it's um, it's like a, the Manson family, maybe, but... Um, yeah. And sure. Justin, the photo shoot in the graveyard, did that take you back to your teenage years? Yes, it did. It yeah, did. It I thought was, so. Yeah. yeah. Although, um, yeah, I, to be honest, there was uh, well, not, not enough black there, really. Yeah. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, but she, I mean, sorry. No, but she, she was clutching a bunch of flowers a la Morrissey. Yeah, did you so. notice that scene though? Where it was all it was it was quite ethereal, wasn't it? Everything was it was mm. very it was as if it was um, um, kind of effect they have if they're trying to do a flashback or um, you know when everything's yeah super bright. Very, yeah, and I don't know if it's that was very intentional. white and hazy. Mm. Yeah, I, I wonder if that was intentional or it was just accidental. Mm. Um, because I haven't um, the I've got the old Shriek Show double disc DVD edition. I didn't pick up the um, more recent Blu-ray edition. So mm. I only because I'm aware there's an extended cut, isn't there? And yes. Have you? Has anyone seen that extended cut? I yeah. have. Wa- yes, I have watched it. It's um, there's no extra scenes of violence or, or scares as such. It's mm. it's mostly dialogue. Okay. Um, you get you get more of Ralph Seymour dancing to Blondie. If if that's your thing, probably the, the, the most significant additions are that the scene just after the waterfall sequence where Megan has been scared in the uh, in the lake, mm. uh, and Jonathan's trying to assure her, look, it was probably just a fish, or you probably just a bit of driftwood you knocked off that made you think it was somebody, and she's there saying, look, I don't want to talk about it, and she looks really upset, and she gets more and more drunk, and that's when she starts dancing. Because uh, the, the way the theatrical cut works now is it just goes tr- more or less straight from that scene to her dancing carefree beside the fire as if nothing has happened. Whereas right. this sort of, you know, mm-hmm. they're getting slow. And the, the dancing sequence is much longer as well, more boogieing to that um, Brad Fidel song. Um, I can't remember what the lyrics of it are. It's just, there's just two words. Mm. Okay, but it's a, it's a fantastic song. Uh, also, there's a scene where just after the the father shoots the stereo, makes the stereo explode or whatever. Um, just after that, Warren and Connie have a fight because she wants to leave. Uh, and then there's an extended scene the next morning of, of her apologising. But apart from that, I mean, there's nothing seemed really. It's just ex- extended dialogue, um, more talk about makeup and things like that. Is it, is, do you know if it was the preferred cut? Of Jeff Lieberman? Or uh, just... I would say not because it does drag a little. Actually, there's one other significant bit in it. Actually, I was mentioning that the deer seems insignificant to the plot, but mm. it, the subject comes back up after Jonathan, after Carter can't find Jonathan in the lake. Um, Connie says something like, he was murdered, wasn't he? And she, he says, we don't know that. He probably fell off the rope bridge. And then she questions him about the deer again. She says, the deer is dead, isn't it? She didn't see it run away. Um, right. Hey so guys, I'm back. What did I miss? 
You missed me talking just a about lot of talking. The, just okay. a lot of talking about the the extended director's cut, which run or not direct the international cut, I think it's called, and it runs twelve minutes longer, but it's all dialogue. Have you gotten into background information yet? No, no not yet. Not really. No, okay. we're going that okay. direction shortly. Yes. Mm-hmm. But is there, is there a um, commentary on there as well? Because there isn't on the sh- not, Shriek no. show. No. Um, there isn't, no, not on the Blu-ray. There is on the Shriek. Yeah, I have the Shriek show one as well, and there is a commentary track on that, yeah. Is there? Yeah. No. Oh. With, with Jeff Lieberman. Okay. Oh, I, I, I watched the um, uh, the interviews with um, uh, yeah. Chris Lemon. Is it Chris Lemon? Um, yeah. And the, the woman who played... Uh, yeah. Do you uh, think he, he's bitter about it all? Bitter? Oh, yeah. oh, Eric. Is that your joke of <laughs> the week? That could be my joke of the week. No. That it's... should have been. That should oh, have you been. missed it, Eric. You missed a chance. <laughs> yeah. I and did. there were you saying you couldn't think of anything. Well, no, I have. I had you have a joke. It's just not related to horror movies at all, but it's a cracker. Okay. Well, we'll... Yeah. Um, well, sh- shall we stop for Eric's joke of the week? Um, and then we'll... Once we've done, uh, done that, we'll come on to some background for the movie. There's a little yes. bit of... Okay, have you got... Yes, a little bit of light relief. It's my joke of the week. It's so, so fantastic. Okay, the entrepreneur who invented the thermally insulated chamber for turning clay into pottery must be very rich now. I mean, he must, he must have made a kiln. <laughs> must have made it a killing, a kiln. Eric, why do you make that woman cry every episode? I didn't, I didn't want to make her cry. Just to make her happy. <laughs> Eric, even your, your lemon joke was better than that, wasn't it? No. <laughs> I actually really liked your, liked your joke. Did you? What, the kiln? Hmm. Oh, I like the kiln joke, too. Yeah, see? Here, here's a me. secret. Here's a very sec- a big secret here, and I'm just going to reveal it now. I secretly do like all of Eric's jokes. I don't think he's told one yet that oh. I haven't chuckled at. Oh, thanks, Nathan. You're my favorite. Thank you. Justin, you're not my favorite. Joseph didn't say anything either. Yeah, well, Joseph's he's my probably working. <laughs> but no, no I, um, I'm just waiting to laugh. Sorry. Yes, well, that's fair enough. So, okay. Okay, on to background then. Nathan. What have you got for us? Have you got anything? Do you guys, I meant to ask you guys, do you guys ask me first because I'm usually the one that has nothing? Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. I've got something this time. <gasps> yes. So, um, in an interview, Jeff Lieberman said that Deborah Benson questioned him as to why she had on like nail polish and makeup at the end of the film. And his explanation for that was it's war paint. So there you have it. She was gearing up for war. But that's just what girls do. They just love their makeup. They're mad for it, regardless of whether yeah, they're being chased by killers or not. Yeah, but she wasn't, though. You know, I mean, no, she, her no, character all, worked all, the whole movie. All girls are. All girls are mad about makeup. Every one of them, eh? Yeah, and Justin. And Justin, yeah. Well, Justin had, like, the black lipstick and, you know, like, the dark. The dark. Well, sometimes he goes makeup. the girly route as well with, like, with caramel cream. <laughs> Eric, who yeah. is the bully? Who is yeah, the real bully, is the bully of the show? <clears throat> yeah, it's Nathan, I think. It's me. Like... I, I thought the goth look was in when Ju- Justin did it. He was, you know, it was cool at the in the time frame. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool or ridiculous? It's a fine line. Joseph, do you have any <laughs> behind the scenes? <laughs> Yes, um, the film's original script was based on a story by Joseph Middleton, and it was titled "The Tennessee Mountain Murders." Yes, and I always think that sounds like one of Nathan's movies from the you find yes. on YouTube, starring, it starring, does. Hazel, starring Hazel Tankersley. Yes, and later it was titled "The Last Ritual." Uh, it had heavy religious themes behind the twin killers' motives, uh, which director Jeff Lieberman felt were kind of you know awful. So uh, he sidestepped that. Uh, it also included a sixth camper named Eileen and a different fate for Megan, uh, or Megan, Megan, whatever you want to call her, um, which entitled her being tossed to her death over a cliff. 
It also included a climax involving Connie being forced to handle handle snakes by the inbred villains before becoming one of their wives. Uh, this version of the script also had more involvement from the Logan family, who were part of the part of the cinema. Lieb- Lieberman re- rigorously rewrote the screenplay from page one by himself to eliminate all the uh, kind of religious religious zones in favor of a more uh, thriller based plot. And I keep hearing myself repeat, so I apologize. Um, uh, Lieberman was heavily influenced, obviously, by Deliverance while writing the film. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, the film was shot on location in the spring of 1980 at the Silver Falls State State Park in Sublimity, Oregon, just outside of nearby Salem, and an hour away from Portland, Oregon. Uh, due to the film's low budget, filming time ranged from 14 to 15 hours per day. The 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens occurred during filming. Uh, According to actor Chris Lemon, he and the rest of the cast were gone for the day on a trip to the Oregon coast uh, when the eruption occurred. Uh, What else? Uh, Despite the authentic weathered appearance, the church used in the opening scene of the film was actually built for the production. Uh, You know, Lieberman said that countless times... uh, our countless strangers showed up at the filming location on the day that the scene with uh, Jamie Rose swimming topless was to be filmed. Uh, Lieberman said that the word of this shoot had apparently gotten out among the local forest rangers. And uh, let's see what else. Uh, several odd occurrences happened during the shooting of the film. Uh, while shooting in the woods one evening, the, the lighting went out without explanation uh, leaving the cast and crew in complete darkness. After after several minutes, uh, the producer yelled out, let there be light, and the lights immediately returned without explanation. Uh, according to Lieberman, despite the numerous reviews of Just Before Dawn that implied it was in, it was entered by the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or The Hills Have Eyes, he had not seen either film at the time of making Just Before Dawn. Uh, Lieberman also stated that he was influenced by Ingmar Bergman when assembling some of the film's compositions. And finally, um, the eerie whistling motif heard in Brad Fidel's music score is a reference to the rescue whistle that Warren carries in the film. Uh, according to the composer, Brad Fidel, many of the ominous sounds in the music score were actually electronically altered audio clips of himself vocalizing droning noises. And do I have anything else? Uh, uh, yeah, initially, Universal Pictures expressed serious interest in purchasing the film, but eventually they backed out. Instead, the film was distributed by Picture Media, a small independent company. Uh, Just Before Dawn was released theatrically in October of 1981 in the United States. It debuted the following month in France, where it was released under the title Survivance as to emphasize a connection with John Borman's deliverance. And that's all I have. Well, that was quite a lot. Justin, yes, do, you have any more to add, do you have any more to add to that? Uh, a few bits and pieces, yes. Um, mm-hmm. So the film was made in the summer of 1980. Um, I think Jeff Liebman says it was sh- shooting in July. Uh, and, and as Joseph said, it was released um, in October 81. It got a certificate, an R certificate, in October 81. But it was on, still in release throughout 1982. And it wasn't a particularly big success, I don't know. I, 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 I don't think so. Presumably it had... A, um, a kind of regional rollout. Uh, I think Jeff Liebman says he saw it in a Florida picture house uh, at some point. Um, the cast uh, said that he partied all the time, and on one occasion they were so hungover that Jeff Liebman sent them all home. So I can obviously that's something I empathise with. Um, mm-hmm. As far as the cast, uh, George Kennedy. Uh, was in Death Ship the year before, and then he was in the kind of the semi well, it's it Wacko. Um, the film that was released in 1982 was a, a parody of slasher movies and horror movies in general. So he was he was in that. Um, Mike Kellen um, was uh, probably uh, most familiar to people listening to this podcast as the 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 camp counts well the the camp owner in Sleepaway Camp. Um, Greg Henry, who played Warren, who was ostensibly the was going to be the hero, but ended up a jibbering wreck at the end of the movie, um, is still in lots of stuff. And he was in Sliver, uh, and possibly most recently uh, the following the TV series uh, with Kevin Bacon. 
uh, which obviously links to the whole Friday 13th thing. But if you're looking at the seven degrees separation, there's also a kind of bizarre, not bizarre, it's not even particularly interesting, but a link between Ralph Seymour. He was in a, a TV series the same year called Code Red, which is coincidentally the, the label that put the film out on Blu-ray. Uh, do, 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 do. There, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we haven't, uh, hasn't been covered. I think uh, that's pretty much it. So there's a couple of other little bits to talk <clears throat> about, but uh, Eric? Okay. Yeah, uh, I just have a few more things to add. I mean, you've covered most of it there uh, between the three of you. Uh, Jeff Lieberman gets a co-writing credit, actually, uh, under the pseudonym Greg Irving. Uh, the character of Daniel was originally uh, meant... What's all that rustling noise? Uh, the character of Daniel was meant to be gay in the original uh, Tennessee Mountain Murder script. Uh, as it, uh, uh, Joseph was saying, there was r- originally a sixth character called Eileen, who was supposed to show an interest in Daniel, and then he kind of rebuffs her, and it forces him to come out of the closet. Uh, and even in the last ritual script, he was still uh, sort of a gay, an out gay character. Uh, it was only when just be- f- when it became just before dawn that was removed. Although you can still read into it what you like, because he's kind of this fifth wheel, and he doesn't really seem to show an interest in you know in the girls. Well, obviously they're attached, so he really shouldn't be. But um, the twins uh, are named Lucas and Luther in in the the last ritual script uh, Richard Keel who was most famous for playing Jaws in Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker was considered for the role of the twins uh, and actually he was really really interested in doing it I don't know why it didn't pan out um, you know he certainly has the physique to to pull it off as it were um, Justin you're saying that Jeff Lieberman says it was filmed in July of 1980 but if if it's to be believed that it was filmed during the Mount St. Helens eruption, that took place on May the 18th, 1980. So mm-hmm. it was not that it makes a huge difference, but uh, f- filming would seem to have been around May of 1980, which was incidentally was the same month that Friday the 13th came out in cinemas. Um, let's see what else. Uh, it was passed uncut by the BBFC in September of 1981 with an X certificate. So I'm assuming it got a theatrical release over here. Uh, maybe you might be able to elaborate on that, Justin. But for its video release in October of 1986, it was cut by seven seconds. Uh, the BBFC website doesn't list exactly what the cuts are, but I'm imagining it is probably the machete to the groin scene. Um Jeff Lieberman, in an interview, is quite disparaging about Friday the 13th and slasher cinema in general. In an interview he did with Diabolique magazine in 2013, um, and again, he said this before, he admits he had never seen Texas Chainsaw or Hills of Eyes before he made uh, Just Before Dawn. Uh, Ralph Seymour, who plays Daniel, uh, we'd recognise him from a film we've covered on the podcast before, Killer Party, he's in, uh, and he's also in Ghoulies. Greg Henry, you know, I was like you, Justin, I was looking him up on IMDb and surprised to see how uh, what a successful career he's had. I mean, he's not a household name, but he was in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy last year, which was one of the monster runaway hits last summer. Uh, and he's also in... Uh, the classic Brian De Palma cross-dressing slasher uh, Raising Cain uh, and also in Body Double actually another De Palma movie uh, Chris Lemon went on to appear in the slasher uh, the one of the best slasher movies of the 90s uh, Wishmaster I think we'll all agree um, actually I was going to ask you Justin because George Kennedy uh, you're probably a big fan of him seen as you love your disaster movies he was in Earthquake and he was in Airport Airport 75 Airport 77 and Airport mm. 79 so I was just wondering uh, would you if you had to watch one George Kennedy movie would it be Just Before Dawn or would it be one of his 70s disaster movies I, it depends what kind of mood I was in um, mm. uh, I think I, uh, having just watched Just Before Dawn I would probably now I choose to watch Airport 75 only because um, I've just watched Just Before Dawn. So is, is it Airport 75 is the Karen Black one, is it? It is the Karen Black one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, and don't uh, don't forget that George Kennedy was also in one of the greatest Creep Show Two segments of all time yes. with the uh, the Indian. Mm. Mm. Creep I love Creep Show Two in general. I, <laughs> I do too. Yes. Yeah. I think it was really cute. Um, I forgot to mention just about George Kennedy, the whole, you know, the, the thing about him talking to his to- his horse, Agatha, and yeah. and talking to his plants. So uh, maybe like, maybe he was crazy as crazy Ralph. I take it all back. <laughs> well, he's just kind of it's a curious choice as a forest ranger, wasn't he? I, I didn't think he particularly believable, but I think it was it, you know he was pretty good in the role and pretty funny. The one thing. That always struck me with him is his famous line, um, at least tell me where you're going, 
because if you don't come back, I, I know how to fill out the report. If you listen to that, it's clearly been, to, it sounds like the two words, of, two bits of sentence have been said at different times. Because the, mm. I don't know if you if you hear, hear it, it's not it's not it's almost like they've glued two sentences together. It's just something that's kind of jumped out at me. I must, but, um, I must have a listen back. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he George Kennedy was in a 1968 film with Mike Kellen. Believe it or not. Mm. Well, yeah, as if that's hard to believe. <laughs> uh, it's the, no. the Boston Strangler. Okay. Um, okay, so they'd yeah. appeared together before that. Yeah. Matthew Mungle did the makeup effects, uh, and he also went on to work on a couple of slasher movies. One we've covered, one we've yet to cover, uh, Pranks, uh, a.k.a. The Dorm That Drip Blood. Uh, and he also went on to Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge. Uh, uh, oh, and he was also did makeup on A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, which is the one that doesn't have the girl with the big hair that gets turned into a cockroach. That's part Damn. four. Yeah. Um. And that's all the behind the scenes I have. Uh, Justin, did you know, did it get theatrically released in the UK? It, it did, but um, I've never seen a poster for it um, on a single release. I, I've seen, uh, I think I've seen it on a double bill with, um, uh, with something, some kind of sexploitation film. Oh, right. Like mm -hmm. female. What's the UK I'd... art for it? The artwork? I'm trying to remember, actually. It, I'm pretty sure the, the old it. The old VHS was kind of a photo of yeah. the... Of the killer. The killer it? holding the machete. It's at that top of the rope bridge, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm not sure if it actually got its own. I've never seen a one sheet, or one sheet, a quad poster for it on on its own. So, um, but um, but it was inter interesting about Jeff Lieberman, about him being um, not very, not a fan of slasher movies. Because when I interviewed him, he said one of the reasons he'd never made any more, had never, he, he hadn't made any more slasher movies. And he didn't really, I don't think he really accepts that. Um, just Before Dawn is a slasher movie as such, but he said because he had daughters, he felt uncomfortable making Just Before Dawn. And that's why he's never made another film since. And this is when, um, on, I like that, but then of course he, um, by, he, he made, um, since I interviewed him, he made um, Satan's Little Helper, which mm. is kind of a black sort of um, comedy slasher movie really, isn't it? Is it any, I still haven't, I have a copy of it, but I still haven't watched it. Is it, is it any good? Yeah, I thought it was, I haven't seen it for ages, but I thought it was pretty good fun. But what does he say in the interview when, um, in 2013? He was just very dismissive, was he, of the slash movie? Didn't yeah, he? yeah, he was just saying, uh, oh, just before Donna's Far Superior Friday the 13th, it was, you know, it was lowest common denominator filmmaking. This is, uh, this is online, you can find it if you search mm. for Diabolique, Jeff Lieberman interview. Okay. Um, That's yeah, the one I read. He, <laughs> yes, he was quite scathing, hmm. Mm. Yes, definitely. He seems to th have a lot of disdain for slasher movies. Mm. Uh, he's kind of, uh, yeah, apparently he's quite a complex individual with some uh, in, um, some uh, unusual political views, so I hear. So, uh, yeah. Okay, right. What, does he, well. does, he want, does he think a turn-up should be president and we should all wear G-strings compulsorily? <laughs> yeah, along those lines, I think, yes. All right, sure. Okay. Um, so, well, that was just before dawn, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no dissenting voices, was there? Apart from no. the, the slight break we had with Eric about to throw himself out a window. But, um, but you know. Yeah, and I, I noticed none of you talked me down. None of you talked me down. Nathan, I did. Nathan was going. Oh, sorry. Come yeah, back. but he was. But I, I don't know. I was detecting some not terribly sincere sincerity in his tone. Did I miss this? Did you yeah, not hear him? Oh, I'll just have to listen back. Yeah, it Eric was, um, was going to throw himself out of his fourth story window. Mm. Yeah, because Justin was bullying me. Justin, uh, how could you? Well, Eric kept on saying Eric would never bully you. <laughs> yeah, he's saying talk me down, make me stop doing it, and um, I was silent. And Nathan was going, "Don't do it, Eric," in a very kind of um, half-hearted. Yeah. yeah, it was very half-hearted. <laughs> But we still have you with us, Eric, so um, yeah, that's just a shame. Yeah. Um, so, uh, feedback, I guess. Have we got any feedback this time? I've got, I've got a, a little one to pull out. I've got a gigantic <laughs> one. Oh, do you want to go first? Yes. Okay. Okay, it says, I am wearing the Cat Flushing a Toilet t-shirt, the one that has a pic of you guys on it too as I am typing up this email. That's awesome. Uh, regarding a night before Easter, I really enjoyed it. Spoiler alert. 
I thought that April Sinclair would survive until the very end as she was the one who told her alcoholic friend that survival story. She even broke out of quite a chokehold from the killer at the end. Sadly, she gets the axe, no pun intended, instead leaving the alcoholic as the final girl. Anyway, it was great fun. On to my next question. I'm trying to purchase all horror media you guys are on. Let me give you a list of what I have and let me know if I'm missing anything. Also, if you can go over one more time what you guys are allowed to mention about what is upcoming. So far, I have the Vinegar Syndrome releases with the Hysteria commentary, Graduation Day, Not Trained to Terror, Savage Water, and Death by Invitation, 88 Films, Graduation Day with the special interview with Justin, Slice and Dice, the slasher film forever, snippets of a commentary from Justin, Puppet Master and Bloody Birthday, Justin's audio commentary, Arrow Video, Fun House, and Slaughter High with Justin's audio commentary. I do know about Vinegar Syndrome's Don't Go in the Woods with your guys' audio commentary and also the upcoming Splatter University from 88 Films that will have a special interview with Justin. Wishing all you the best, an avid fan, Mike. And Nathan wants to say, damn you, Justin, before we continue. Sorry? I said, damn you, because you are involved with a... With with Splatter University, one of the greatest films of all time. I, I didn't hope know you, you were give involved it. In yeah, I, I did. Uh, uh, did the doing an intro for it, like I do with Graduation Day. Uh, you nice. are you giving it the respect that it deserves? No, um, <gasps> but I'm, <laughs> no. I, How could you, I, Nathan? I think you should jump out the window now. <laughs> I should, but I'm on a f- first story, so I don't think it's going to matter. Mm. Oh, okay. I'm also doing. Um, uh, the Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers I've done a commentary for which is upcoming from 88 Films and um, Scalps as well, I've done an intro for that If so. they do The Last Slumber Party I need to be involved, all I ask is that they pay for my air travel and lodging <laughs> over to um, Great Britain Oh and I don't stay in a hotel that's under four stars Um well, that and should be happening. And I will also need food, of course. And I also need, like, some fun money, you know, for, like, traveling the countryside. Oh, don't stop there. Would you like a houseboy to cater to your every whim as well? Sure. Okay. There you go. Well, these are all the perks Justin does get when he does, does his Yeah, this is true. It's, I get collected from the airport in a stretch limo and then yeah. um, go to the Hilton on a five-star penthouse apartment and uh, champagne and vegan caviar. And, um, and all the, all the drugs they give you and free cap like, for every commentary you do. Exactly. So it's it's an amazing, it's amazing <laughs> gilded life I have. It is. <laughs> so jealous. Glamour. Just when just when I thought caviar couldn't get any grosser, they have vegan caviar. How can caviar be? How can you have a vegan version of caviar? They do. They um IKEA sell this kind of um thing. It's it's like seaweed, but it's so it's, well, it's, it's, it's caviar not <laughs> fish eggs. Yes, but it's not actually uh, caviar. It's not even sold as caviar, but it's it, it looks a bit like caviar. Oh, so, so that's what it's nicknamed. Mush. Nicknamed the vegan if you, caviar. If you, yeah, if you leave a banana out in the sun long enough, it'll turn to black mush. You can call that caviar, vegan caviar. Hey, well, Justin, I had a vegan that. chicken sandwich the other day. Hmm. It was um, actually soy and vegetables, <laughs> so it wasn't real chicken. It was actually, it tasted just like chicken. Well, there you go. It was it was quite it was quite good actually. Well, we had yesterday we had um, takeout vegan pizza. Had four pizzas, all different, all with vegan cheese, from a local place. So you see, we're moving on. <laughs> um, you see, uh, vegan well, cheese, I can comprehend. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I had a vegan burger, but uh, it made me sick. <laughs> it may it may have just been the brand. It might. It was frozen. Brand. We well, should should fresh. afford it first. Did you? Uh, to- well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that might help, but I still don't think it would have helped the flavor. Okay. But anyway, anyway, uh, it's thrilling. Want to try one that's is. fresh? Hmm. Well, this is scintillating. A scintillating yes. conversation. <laughs> so we've we've kind of gone off slightly off topic um, from our. Um, have you got any more well, to read out from that? Well, actually, this guy we didn't answer his question. He wants to know what we have if he's missing anything that has any of us involved and what else we could talk about that's upcoming. Well, did he mention to... night before Easter? He did mention night before Easter, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he did yes. mention it. Uh, what about Madman? 
Madman Blu-ray commentary. Yeah. Um, we haven't done that an, yet. No, we haven't done that yet. That's, That's coming soon. And there's another one. We can't say what it is yet. That will be coming probably late this summer. Is that the uncut Friday 13th part two? For Paramount? Yeah, that's oh, that it. one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Which we've all, we all have a screener of that at the moment. It's yeah, really it's yeah. good, actually. Oh, isn't it? It's really good. I, how gory I cannot it was. believe, I cannot believe the, the, the gore effects when he hits him in the face with the machete. I know. And in the wheelchair. God, I can, when people see this, it's just going to be great. Yeah. And it's not even April Fool's yet. But, no. I know. but um, hopefully a few more in the, uh, in the uh, in the works, he's not missing any though in his list, is he? Uh, that you've been involved uh, in. Justin, has he got? Has he got, has he got video nasties too on his list? No, it's not. So that'd be another one to look for. Yeah, video nasties: the definitive guide, volume two. Justin is on. Mm. Was it eighty-eight films? No, uh, no, that nucleus. is um, nucleus. nucleus? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's a few out there, Mike, to to seek out. Yes. Oh, and I didn't see. I don't know if you have Justin's book, so you should. Uh, if you don't have that, you should. He pick does. That too. Anal oh, okay. Paprika Thirteen. Yes. Oh, Eric. there's that too. Is that on on IMB, IMDb yet? Let me have a look. Oh God. It better not be. <gasps> oh my God! It really is this time. No, it's is not. It? I don't know. I'm not looking. Eric. I'm gonna look. Three. Four. Look. No, it's not. Have you looked? God. Oh, Night Before Easter, Gory Graduation, Bloody Homecoming, and... Yeah, nickname Inga. <laughs> <laughs> he is a resident and citizen of Ireland. Yeah. Oh, we're talking about of Ireland. We see, you saw that um, that trailer. Oh, yeah. Sent through for the oh, Irish. Yeah. <gasps> oh, that movie looks out. awesome. I can't wait. What was it called again? Uh, is it Jack Hammer Massacre or something? No, was it... Um, uh, let me have a let me have a look. Again, this is the the uh, scintillating thing. Scintillating Talking searching on the internet audio yes. segment. Eric, are you involved in the film industry in Ireland? You sh- Hello? Hello. We've lost everyone. Back in one second. Second. What are we talking and about? We're back. <laughs> are we back? Sorry, I don't know what's happening. It's oh. one of those. What? Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Nothing. I'd, I'd forgotten where we were before we had our Skype meltdown. Okay. Well, um, we are in feedback. We are in feedback. Well, you probably, you probably yes. remember that. Yes. You probably, where, where you oh, we were to, talking about that Irish slasher movie. Oh, yes. And just yes. look up the title. And then, and then I crashed the whole internet like Kim Kardashian. <laughs> so I'm oh, not yeah. gonna. I with your, look with it your up. bottom. <laughs> Did you crash it with your bottom? No. I tried looking. I tried uh, to look something up on my iPad at the same time, and I think I may have crashed my internet connection anyway. So I won't do that. But there's some Irish slasher movie which looks awful, um, and so it's right up Nathan Street. Um, and um, we believe we know that Eric's probably going to be the killer, aren't you, Eric? <laughs> Let me see. It's called Skeleton Crew with oh, a K. Right. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> Yes. Okay. Well, we we might cover that at some point. But um, is there anything left in that email from Mike? Nathan? No. That no. Was it. That was it. Okay. Well, thank you, Mike. And you've you've probably you've probably got the lone person in the um, the t shirt. Did you I have a hoodie? You got a hoodie. That's right. I've seen you in a hoodie. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you can. Can people still buy merchandise? Um. Yeah, I think no one ever really bought one. I think maybe like two people purchased them, but I think they're on Cafe Press somewhere. Okay, well there you go. So, um, you know, make us millionaires. You can see mm-hmm. it, it, it's on the the catwalk in Paris this year. Um, right. Well, thank you, Nathan. Uh, Eric, do you have anything? Yes, I have one here. It is from Mark, and he says, "Dear Cat Flushers." Hope this mail finds you in good cheer. You and your fortnightly uh, broadcasts have kept me playfully amused now for many years. As a quartet, you are truly the Beatles of horror podcasts. I'll let you figure out which one of you is Ringo. Eric. Justin. Justin. Eric. Justin. Eric. No, actually, Eric's more Yoko Ono. (sighs) Don't want to be Yoko Ono. 
Recently, I have found that the cry of it's not a slasher film has regularly been heard during your discussions. Notable controversial examples from your history include Predator and Rabid Grannies, neither of which were my choice, I my dad. Uh, it seems as though you require some kind of system that will enable this argument to be put to bed altogether. So I've come up with a modest proposal for you. During your next Algonquin round table section, perhaps you would consider doing the following. Each of you must take it in turn to discuss two specific tropes or elements that you feel must feature in a slasher movie. Once you are finished, you should have eight statements of fact and can then operate as an unarguable checklist for any future not as slasher discussions. The rule must then be applied that in order to qualify within the subgenre, any title you pick must tick off at least five of these statements. I believe the system should work unless Eric attempts to slip must star Patrick Swayze and must feature the music of Bill Medley and Jennifer Warrens into his picks. Which I think <laughs> which I will do. Possible. Yeah. Bon chance, Mark. Well, thank you for that, Mark. That's a good idea. Yes, thank I you, Mark. Rab- I don't think Rabbit Grannies would have qualified if we'd had that criteria set out. No. And also, well, neither would several things we picked. <laughs> and also probably um, a future pick by a certain somebody probably won't qualify either. Mm. So um, that, that would, I think it's a good idea. I think maybe um, if Nathan's up, up for it, uh, maybe that would be a good. It would be a good thing to discuss uh, slasher movie tropes on the next show, which we're we'll saying what is shortly. Um, but I think, unfortunately, uh, although it's a good idea, it might be that this certain someone whose name rhymes with Mosif um, likes to choose mm-hmm. things that sometimes might be a bit controversial. I know his next pick is not going to be is going to be well probably possibly his most controversial pick of all yes yes so so we'll see but yeah maybe we can have that as a a talking point for next time so thank you mark um joseph do you have anything or joseph may be away for a minute because he is possibly not quite engaged (laughs) He's in work, so he's having to do stuff. But I do have a, I do have one here, so I will read out mine. Um, if I, here we go. It was um, just a little short one. I, it's from Mike again. I don't know if it's a different Mike. But no, anyway. mine was from Mark. Oh, Mark. Oh, who, yeah. Okay. Who's was yours from, Nathan? Mike. Oh, Mike. sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Eric. Right. God, I'm sorry. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> There's no need to take the Lord's name in vain and on the Sabbath day as well. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. So I forgot I was talking to um, Mr. Catholic. Um, right. I was wondering if you guys have seen any of these three horror gems. Highway no. to Hell. What do we know? You don't even know what they are yet. <laughs> Highway to Hell, 1991. Haunted Ween, 1991. The Spider Labyrinth, 1988. It says, if you haven't seen them, I'm so happy to introduce you to these in my... Uh, opinion classics if you have then i'm sorry i'm sorry as said in the uh, the voices don't go into the woods and that's mike so i've seen at least one of those um so have i yeah okay i've seen so i've seen I. spider labyrinth that's the one i've seen yes i've seen haunted wayne okay and i don't know if you guys have asked where i was but i got called away again so sorry that's okay. we did yes we, we did, did. We did. We were called away. but we okay the professionals that we are we um we carried on yeah so I don't even think I've heard, but like twenty percent of this episode, I'm actually going to have to listen back for once to see what happened. <laughs> well, we've got this bit of feedback. It was saying, um, "Have uh, any of us seen Highway to Hell, 1991, Haunted Ween, also 91, and the Spider Labyrinth?" And me and Eric have seen Spider Labyrinth, which is the is the um, Italian one. Isn't it's an it? Italian Spider movie, Labyrinth. yeah. Yes, That's kind of yeah. Quirky. I've seen yeah. I've seen all three, so there you go. Oh, have you? Okay. Um, but Nathan's seen Haunted Ween. So what was um, Highway to Hell? That was the one with um, the guy who played Jason in Jason Lives in it, wasn't it? C.J. Was Graham? It? Oh, I don't know. I think so. I think I remember it from um, Fangoria, but I never got to see it. Okay. Is that the one with the kind of the, the satanic highway cop? Yeah, and he's got sort of carvings in his skin. Yes, I've yeah. never seen it, but I remember seeing yeah seeing photos of it in Fangoria. Mm. So, um, but Nathan, Nathan, what's... what is any good? Well, I haven't seen that one. I've saw Haunted. Oh, Wayne. sorry. All right. And so, Joseph, is any good? 
Joseph's gone again. He's Sorry, been called Joseph. away. Haunted Wayne was entertaining. Um, it's it's. I mean, it's really cheaply made. You can tell. I mean, it's not like I wouldn't call it a good movie, but it's my kind of movie. Yeah. Well, that's all we need to know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> We're still dreading how many how many more weeks is it till Nathan's pick that he's been. Well, we have a you know, six weeks. Um, so excited about this pick you guys have no idea probably my most anticipated movie choice so far yes yeah. it's, aren't it's you guys glad you brought me in a few episodes into this show <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you yeah. for the thank you for the gift of crazy fat ethel part two <laughs> y'all would never have known me if i hadn't have done uh, you know well that's true i think it, i think show. your your double bill will make for an in- entertaining episode Yes, it will. I, I think it will. Yes, but we've um, we have got a certain date on the calendar coming up for the next episode, which is a very big hint, which we will talk about. Um, yes, uh, and I've just mentioned it actually. Yes. Oh yes, yes you have. Yes. Um, well, I suppose we can mention it now, really, can't we? We're going to be covering um, as it's Friday thirteenth, the first of three Friday thirteenths this year. Yes, another um, one coming up in March. Yeah. Yes, so we're going to be. Uh, um, Exhuming Jason for Jason Lives, Friday 13th, part six, um, which yeah. I think is going to be quite an entertaining episode. So that's coming up uh, next on Hysteria Continues. Um, um, I- where are we? I got called away again. These people, I swear to fucking Christ, it's Sunday. Go home. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like Super Bowl Sunday. They should go home and watch yeah, football. No kidding. Or Fuck. Yeah. I, I can't wait feedback. for the Super Bowl. I, I, I hope the Patriots win. I don't know if we've passed over feedback, but I have feedback. I don't know where we are in the episode, so oh, I apologize. We're just waiting. It's perfect timing, Joseph, because yes. you can go okay. see you can nicely into your one. Okay, unless someone comes in here, you know, waving their dick around. Um, here's my feedback. This is from Ara Alishan. I think he's Mike's brother. He says, hello again. I've been meaning to write in since my last correspondence back in September, but I've been rather busy investigating the rather sultry Steve Christie and Pamela Voorhees theory you proposed a while back. Needless to say, my findings have been inconclusive. Going back to my previous email, I really must recommend The Roost from 2005. House of the Devil and The Innkeepers are both much better films, but I believe you would all really appreciate Ty West's earliest feature. Unfortunately, I didn't really care for the sacrament. There was nothing wrong with it, per se, but I suppose I personally prefer bat-infested barns, bad babysitting gigs, and the ghost of Madeline O'Malley over a retelling of the Jonestown Massacre. Moving on, I really have to recommend Midnight Movie again from 2008. It's an entertaining supernatural slasher, and I would love to hear your impressions. Uh, On to gory graduation. Joseph and Nathan, I really admire the Indiegogo page the two of you have set up for this project and am more than happy to contribute to the cause. I pass the word along to my brother, Mike, and believe he's made a contribution as well. As for my perk, I had a very difficult time narrowing it down to just one film. Uh, He selected the uh, pick a film on our show, uh, which is why are your other listeners better move fast. But for now, my personal selection for this fine podcast is the criminally underrated, and I'm going to leave that out, and you'll have to find that out later, what he picked, uh, which is one of my all-time favorites. Is it a slasher? Ask the Predator. Your pal from the City of Angels, Ara. P.S. I absolutely love your next and the guest, and can't wait to see Simon Barrett and Adam Wingard's next collaboration. P.P.S. My wife and I are excitedly, excitedly expecting our first daughter in May. We've narrowed down our list of potential names to Erica, Josephine, Justine, and Nathan- Nathanielina. Thoughts? <laughs> Erica, oh, Nathanielina. No, obviously, I think Erica. obviously, Nathanielina. Well, if if you are really expecting, uh, congratulations. But um, yes. if you're not, then well, <laughs> congratulations. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, tell us what you decide. But she could have a, a, a sort of quadruple monikered, you know, like one of like who was that? You know that that um, very strange looking Spanish princess who died, the one who danced, and she was about ninety five, and she had about fourteen names. The one with the big lips. Yeah. I don't know. No, Frida. Shade. 
No, it's a, didn't you see? She had like she like a hair like a crash helmet, like a perm, and she had big lips. Oh, and she uh, danced. Stefania Stella. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I can't remember her name now. I'm not going to look it up because last time I tried to Google him, I think I broke the internet. So, um, have but, you um, announced what we're doing next time? We have. We yes, have. Friday okay. Thirteenth Part Six. Yes. Um, extravaganza, another Friday Thirteenth Extravaganza. And we're we're coming to the end of the Goodens, aren't we? We're going to be right. Actually, we're going to have um, the new Blood, uh, and also Jason yeah. takes Manhattan this year as well. So yes. lots of fitting. Wow. It's, it's, will Arla's? Would we appreciate Arla's pick without actually saying what it is? Uh, I think we all would. Yes, actually. Okay. Well, we can tell us off air, and also we can discuss uh, the motivation for the guest off air as well. So, um, but uh, I think that is about it is unless we've got any other feedback no that's it unless you want to play the feedback jingle have we got one unless you want to play the feedback jingle oh yeah, yeah that joseph one. is the details oh yes okay so if you want to write in um especially um with your thoughts on friday 13th part six we are going to be recording um three episodes in a row because um a scheduling conflicts <coughs> eric <coughs> um we will um so if you do want to get back to us about Friday 13 part six then do it in the next week but this is how to do so be sure to search for and like us on facebook follow us on twitter at thc underscore podcast our voicemail is 858-233-9281 and you can email us directly at the.hysteria.continues at gmail.com yes so keep them coming eric mm-hmm. um ha. do we have anything else left to say or are we all talked out we should uh skadoot skadoot yeah okay well if you um yeah well hope you enjoy the episode and um we'll see you round i'm not it is crystal lake isn't it part six Forest no, Green. Forest, forest green. green, yeah. Yes, we'll see you in a date in Forest Green in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. So cha 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 ah ah ah. Exactly. So and we're playing out with some of the ambient music from just before dawn. Our, and maybe a little bit of play blondie. blondie. Well, yes. Well, I thought oh, we might a do a little bit of both. How about Yay, that? Because both yeah. are brilliant. Yes. Okay. Right. Just well, like me. No. Well anyway, thank you for listening. I'm brilliant. And, and um uh we'll we'll get um, we're going to get Eric to call the Samaritans later, just to make sure he doesn't throw himself out the window after the episode. Because <laughs> we're obviously very worried about you. We might have to inter- do an inter- intervention. I think you might. Yeah, or not. Because um, I've got lunch date, so it might have to be tomorrow. But anyway, Eric, graveyard. you'll still be around. Sorry? Is your lunch date in a graveyard? <laughs> no. Um Anyway, well, hopefully it hasn't been too um, Skype issued for this one. It's a little, yes. got a little bit better towards the end, didn't it? It did. But now I'm rambling, so we will bend you. Play the music to do. Yes, okay. So say goodbye to the good people. Goodbye. Until next time. Bye. 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 <laughs> Does te- tofu taste nice when you eat it off a tombstone? Would you rather watch the Super Bowl, Joseph, or the last slumber party twice in a row? The problem with that is that Eric doesn't have, like, the the capacity to, you know, put that up his rectum. Pardon? Would it fit in in Tina Turner? I like Justin's pardon. Pardon me. Do you have any grey poupon?